Right. Yeah, so today we do have a very interesting topic, thank God, and I really enjoyed uh, doing research. I started like beginning research yesterday, and um, at some point I realized, okay, I have to pare down and just stick to what I'm teaching, because otherwise I'm going to be stuck on the subject for three, three oh, weeks just researching, because so it's just so beautiful and so much uh, going on, and so much interesting history and, 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 and stuff. So what are we looking to do to narrow down what we're trying to do? We're going to, first of all, learn what is Tachelis? What is it? The blue string that many have in their tzitzis. What is that? Halakhically speaking, what is it? And just actually, what is it? Right. It's a die, but, but what is it? And then that's number one. Number two is when and why did it stop? At oh. some point, most Jews did not, weren't, weren't using it anymore. Number three, when and why did it reemerge? Oh, we yeah. do see some Jews wearing it nowadays, right? So it right. reemerged at some point. Why and when and how? And then number four, clearly we all know that the Chabad stance is not to have it, which is why none of us have it. Right. Why? So those are, those are the four stages of how we're going to go through this. Oh, okay. like, like what is the, right. the trailers? When and why did it stop? When and why did it continue? And where, is the, where does Chabad stand on this whole subject? This is where we're going to go to. So you're saying that it did exist like a trailer. Of course it does. Okay. Terry says, right? So let's, no, yeah. so let's start from the beginning. Yes. Let's okay. start from the beginning. The beginning is, of course, scripture, which we say every day in our Shema. The third paragraph of Shema is the paragraph describing Titus. And there it says, and the second verse is the most important. So it's by Midbar chapter 15 and the Parsha Shlach a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Torah reading, right? Where there it says, Hashem Lamar, God tells Moses saying, read in English. Actually, I'll read the next plus in Hebrew because this is important. Dabrel b'nei Yisrael, speak to the Jewish people. You see verse there, 38. and tell them. also make for themselves tzitzis, al kan on the corner of their garments. The daraisam, throughout their generations. So that's commandment, that's element number one that Torah says. Hi, Yossi. Yeah, that's uh, one of each to Yossi. Right, so the first element that Torah says, put tzitzis on the corner of your clothing. Then it says, the nosnu al tzitzis hakanov, and you should put on to the tzitzis which is at the corner. Let's, get, let's read this again because you have to get this clear. Paul yeah. says, the osilem tzitzis al kanfavideyem, make tzitzis, which translates as fringes, on the corners of the garments. Item A, Torah says. Then Torah says, the nosnu al tzitzis hakanov, and you shall place onto that fringed corner, psil techeles a fringe of trellis. So there's a th two things. Number one, put fringes on your corners and B, on those fringes and corners, you should put trellis. Clear? Sorry? Why does it specify wool? Where does it specify wool? Oh, because the trellis is wool. Okay, that's a good question. Why, what trellis means? Does it mean a color or also a material? Now the, the word trellis comes up in the Mishkan also. As one of the tchelas uh, vargomon, the telas shani is part of the materials slash colors in the mishkan is also the word tchelas there. But this is the pasuk that we're looking at here, which is the pasuk says two things. Number one, you should put tzitzis, which tzitzis means fringes, on the corners of your garments. A B on the fringed corner, you should put a strand of tchelas, which they translate here as a sky sky blue wool thread. So tells us two things, clear tzitzis and tchelas, two different things. Okay, the verse goes on to say that these are a reminder of all the mitzvahs. And you should remember my mitzvahs and keep them, be holy, and remember that I took you out of the land of Egypt. Right? These are the verses that conclude. We read this every day. And the indicating word of the color is tchelis. That's is right. Color. Either color or, or, or material. That's We're not going to actually get into that, but it's, it could oh. be one of the two. It's either color or, or we'll see a little bit from Rambam, actually. Okay. But it either means a color or a, or a garment or a material or both, like a oh. blue wool. Okay. Could be blue, look, could be wool. Like, 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 for example, um, I think telashon is also like that. It's a material that's also it's a simple. color. No, it's a it's material that's in a certain color. Oh, really? It's given a certain name, yeah. So it's material plus color that makes that name. Crimson? Is that it? Yeah, that, that's the last one, but it's wool specifically. Right. right? Okay. Crimson. So that, Crimson. sorry? Yeah. It, it's like, it's, it's yeah, like a burgundy. Like it's like a burgundy. But that, that's the last shiny. That's not Taylor's. Taylor's is a sky blue wool. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave the material out for now. Right. Looking at the color specifically. So we're saying that the. It's usually, Taylor's is wool. It is that that's it's definitely blue. Right. The question is that does also mean well, but it, 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 let's, let's just assume a, uh, that's correct. 
fabric and the color. Is Again, we separate we separate in English between colors and 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 fabrics, but you could have a name for something that's both a color and a fabric. Yeah. So that's what tchelis is. It's a wool dyed in such color that it's makes tchelis. So if you took the red. sorry, they probably only have. A no, well, they, I mean, they would have had uh, flax, they would have had silk, they would have had uh, linen, cotton, maybe cotton, not so much because in that region, but certainly linen and certainly um, lin and silk, uh, linens from flax, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, okay, so just to be, make it clear, so the word tehelis both means material that is dyed in a certain color. So it's wool. Okay, so now let's see. So these two, there's just two parts to the mitzvah then, as we just read from the pasuk. Fringes, sits in the corner. And then at that fringed corner, put this thing called trellis. Yeah, two parts of the mitzvah. We don't, we don't have trellis. Right. What, what gives? This right. is where we're going. Okay, so the next text on the second page there is the Gemara and Menachis, the tractate which opens up with the words, ha trellis. And then the second page on the, the English text. We're not going to go to this text for a while. We're looking at this text. But we're looking at the, yeah, page two on the one that has the logo on the top there. We're going to be on that page for a little while until we get to the Rashab, which is the other text. Wow. Yes. So the Gemara, Menachis, sorry, Menachis, page 38a. Read the Mishnah. I'm going to read it in English. The absence of the, school, the sky blue trelet strings do not prevent fulfillment of the mitzvah of ritual fringes with the white strings. And the absence of white strings does not prevent the fulfillment of the mitzvah with the sky blue strings. So this is very important wow. because you have sometimes a mitzvah that has a number of units. And in order to fulfill the mitzvah, you have to do all of these things. Otherwise, the mitzvah is not fulfilled. Like sphere. Sorry? Like sphere. So when it came to sphere, that was the discussion. It's each yeah. night independent mitzvah. Right. Or is, unless you do all 49, you haven't done anything. Right? right? You haven't counted because, count, because the mitzvah is to count a unit of 49. At least in that one opinion, we discussed that. That's right. So the same thing here. You might have imagined that what the Torah says to have corners, and then in those corners, put blue fringes, that it's one singular mitzvah with two details. And unless you have both, you have a fulfilled the Mishnah, the mitzvah, right? Therefore comes the Mishnah and says, no, one doesn't prevent the other. You can wear just like your, your hand to fill in and your head to fill in two different mitzvahs. Now the uniqueness here is that it's not two different mitzvahs, it's one mitzvah, well, one mitzvah that has two parts, but they're independent of each other. You can do one without the other. So if all you had was the blue string, Wear that and you fulfill that. If all you have is the white string, do that. Right? Okay. If one has, it goes on to say, if if one has only one, he wears it without the other. Absence of the phylacteries of the arm does not prevent fulfillment of the mitzvah of the phylacteries of the head. And absence of the phylacteries, phylacteries meaning fill in, of the head does not prevent the fulfillment of the mitzvah of the phylacteries of the arm. If one has only one, he dons it without the other. So when it comes to tefillin, it's more easy to understand because they're actually two different mitzvahs. Oh, oh, they're two separate mitzvahs. I thought they had to be done separate. They should be done together, and it, it's not so simple that you can do one without the other. Certainly, the head to fill in, you can do it without the arm to fill in, but it's not our discussion today. But in theory, one without the other is still a mitzvah. Okay. But over there, it's much easier to understand. When it comes to the it's easier to understand because they're actually two different mitzvahs, at least according to most halacha counters. I think it, it's, we only say that because if a person in the form of a son is missing an arm, he can still be in filling. With his head, that's right. With his head, that's right. But not like he can choose to opt out of the arm. No, 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 but it doesn't feel like that's it. right. No. You can't do that because they're, they're actually two different mitzvahs. Right. Whereas here, it's one mitzvah, and yet they still don't need each other. You still oh. can do one without the other. That's the big finish of tzitzis. When it comes to tefillin, it's actually two different mitzvahs. Right. When it comes to tzitzis, it's one mitzvah, as we'll see soon from Rambam. It's actually one mitzvah that has two parts, and yet you can still have one without the other, which means my tzitzis are fully full tzitzis, even though I don't have the blue trellis. Right. And if someone had tehillahs, it would be fully full tzitzis, even though it didn't have the white. Wow. Clear? Even though, obviously, a person should have both. Right. Right? Which don't. Right. That's what we'll get to. Okay, so now the Gemara comments on this Mishnah. The Gemara suggests, let us say, that this Mishnah is not in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Because as it is thought in the Braita, when the verse requires one to place white and sky blue strings upon the corners of his garments, and, there, and then states, that you may look at it, it teaches that the lack of either one prevents fulfillment of the mitzvah for the other. This is the statement of Yehuda Nasi. So Yehuda Nasi says, because the Torah says, you shall see them, you shall see it in the singular. You shall see it after describing the two different strings, the white and the blue, indicating that the white and blue are one unit and you have to have them both to see it. So according to Yehuda, we are not fulfilling our mitzvah of tzitzis. According to Yehuda. 
because we're missing the blue. Right? However, but the rabbis say that lack of one does not prevent the fulfillment of the mitzvah with the other. So the Mishnah just lists only the, the, the sage's view, not the Buddha's view. So there's not a Machlech Yeah. Machlech yeah. And the whole argument is blue because they don't have gloves and that's what let, let, We'll get to it. We'll get to where we're going to today. Well, this is where we're going. 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 Yeah. Yeah, this is where we're going. Okay, so the, we're just getting the background to all this. Okay, so the Gemara inquires, what is the reasoning of Rebuhuddha Anasim, i.e., how does he derive his ruling from the verse? The Gemara explains, as it is written, and they shall put on the fringes of the corner a sky blue thread. The fringe of the corner is a reference to strings that are the same type as the corner of the garment itself. So since garments are usually white, the phrase is referring to white strings, right? And then it is written in the same verse, a sky blue thread. So the Torah itself, when describing the sky blue thread, describes it in conjunction with the other threads you already have there. And those other threads you already have are white. And thus they have to go together. And then the merciful one says, Torah says, in the following verse, referring to both types of strings, and it shall be with you for a fringe that you may look upon it in the singular. This teaches that one does not fulfill his obligation until both types are present together. Wow. Okay. Amara asks, how do the rabbis who hold that one can fulfill one obligation without the other understand this verse? Amara answers, they hold that the phrase that you may look upon it indicates not it as in one single unit of two, but it as in each one of it. It in the singular, meaning you can look at either one, even if you don't have the other one. Now, one fulfills the mitzvah with, with each one individually. So where is it who takes the word singular to mean the two of them are a singular unit? Right. Whereas the sages take the, word, take the word singular to mean, oh, you can only have one of them. Oh, that's, that's enough. Right. So the same singular can mean one of two things, right? Because the Torah describes two different strings, and the Torah says you should look at it in a singular. Sages say, look at it means it's singular. So either one, as long as you have one to look at. Whereas the word on us, he says, oh, the two together are a singular unit, it. And if we have to have both. This is the dispute. And of course, that as we know, follows the sages. Yeah. So let's see Rambam, who elucidates this for us a little bit more in the halach. Third page there. Rambam, opening of the laws of tzitzis. So chapter one of laws of tzitzis. Each paragraph is another halacha. So halacha one, we're on page three on the, that packet there of text. Hmm? Yeah, Rambam laws of tzitzis at the beginning, in English. The tassel that is made on the fringes of a garment from the same fabric as the garment, this is called tzitzis because it resembles the locks of the head, the corners of the head, the payas, and there, and with respect, respect to the corners of the head, the Pasuk says in Ezekiel, and he took me by the locks on my head using the word tzitzis. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So the word tzitzis, the, 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 the things that hang off the corner of our garments come from the payas that hang off the corner of our heads. This is actually a second kiddush, though, I find, because it says that uh, the fringe of the garment from the same fabric of the garment, meaning that the... Yes. That's a whole different set of law. That should be, which is why in Chabad we dafka wear wool. Right. So here it's clearly okay. We're not going down this roll right now, right. but the Chabad we wear dafka wool uh, garment so that the string be the same material as the right. corner. Whereas others wear cotton, and then you get into the question of should you now have cotton strings? Then it's subpar because it's best to have wool. Right. Maybe you should have wool, but then the wool is not the same as the color as the as the yeah. as the, oh, as the oh, fabric oh, of the garment, oh, oh. which is why we have wool tzitzis. Okay, but that's not again not a discussion today. Use another place yeah. Yeah. You can see there in the but he grabbed me by the tzitzis of my head, meaning yeah. the corner of the hairs, the, the payas. Okay. So this tassel is called the white strands, tzitzis, lovan, because we are not commanded to dye it. So the Torah did not establish a fixed number of strands for this tassel. Okay, we have four, we have which become which fold into eight, but we'll leave that aside for now. Okay, so. Why is the tzitzis called the white? Not because it's, the Torah says, thou, th thy tzitzis shall be white. Mm -hmm. It just says, put fringes. And if you put fringes without dyeing it, they're white. Right. So that's, that's why it's white. Okay. Halacha number two. Like, well, natural undyed color is white. It's white, that's right. So you're taking a white, you're taking a strand and putting it on. Torah didn't say to do anything with it. It just said, put a strand. So it's staying the way it is, white. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then the Torah commands us something else. Torah says, this corner that has that strand, add another strand of, of, of trellis, right? So this continues Rambam. Then we take a strand of wool that has dyed a sky-like color and wind it around this tassel. So that the, the blue is supposed to be wrapped around the white tzitzis, okay? This strand is called trellis. 
The Torah did not establish a fixed requirement for the number of times that this strand should be wound. So which means, biblically speaking, all you have to do is take a white string, attach it to the corner, take a blue string and wrap it around the white one. And that's it. We do much more than that. We have four folded into yeah. two becoming eight, one of them being blue, and then you wrap, use the blue to wrap around and wrapping it around a bunch of times. But that's all that's all minog and that's all rabbinic, but it's not biblical. But again, that's not, this, not our discussion now. Hmm? And then the whole Rizal. But no, but the the, the number the of ties and the separations, yeah. it's all it's all laid out in the Shulchan Aruch, yeah. not the Rishon Aruch. Okay, so thus continues in Halacha three Rambam. This mitzvah contains two commandments: to make a tassel the fringe of garment. That's number one. Make a tassel. That's 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 it's the white one. And number two, and to wind the strand of tailet around the tassel. Both these dimensions are indicated by Numbers 1538, which states, and you shall make tassels, number one, and you shall place on tassels at the corner a strand of tailet, number two, as we saw from the Pesach earlier. Now, continues Ambam, the absence of tailet does not prevent the mitzvah from being fulfilled with the white strands, nor does the absence of the white strands prevent the mitzvah from being fulfilled with the tailet. Just like, like the Chachamim, like the sages. What is implied? A person does not have tailet, should make tits from white strands alone. Similarly, if tissues were made from both white strands and tehillet, and afterwards the white strands snapped and were reduced until they did not extend beyond the corner of the garment, and thus only the tehillet remained, it is still acceptable. Now, here's the key that I want to read this last key. This, so far, everything we said, we have till now, we know already from what we learned until now. But here's what I want to show you. The right, Rambam. Now, although the absence of one does not prevent the mitzvah being fulfilled with the other, they are not considered as two mitzvahs, unlike the film which are two different mitzvahs in the 613. Instead, they are a single mitzvah, only one of the 613. Whether the tzitzis a person wears of his, on his garment are white, tchelet, or a combination of two colors, he fulfills a singular mitzvah. So it's almost as if Taita says the optimal way to do the mitzvah is white and blue. But if you do one or the other, you still fulfill the entirety of the same mitzvah. What's the difference? What's the difference? Rabbis also it. That's right. No, no, the, yeah, 100%. But I'm just saying that I'm articulate this, that it's one mitzvah. The, the Gemara doesn't say clearly that it's one mitzvah divided into, but he's saying this, right? Sorry? So maybe, maybe Kamis is just the Hidder. Well, it's not the Hidder because it, it's, it's biblical. Right. Hidder would be like sometime later we decided to do it more beautiful and add some element, right? right? So the Hidder is that we have four strands and not one or whatever. Right. But this is, the Torah says you should have blue. Right. But it's right. a unique kind of mitzvah where the Torah almost gives you three options in how to fulfill the mitzvah. The optimal one, both white and blue. And then subcategory is one of the other, either one, either white or blue, with both of which you will fulfill the same mitzvah. Which means obviously, optimally, we would do the blue. Right, we have the blue as well, considering that's literally stated in the verse, right? So let's hear. Uh, the sage of the early generations related, and they shall be a tzitzit for you, that teaches that they are both one mitzvah. Okay? The presence of each of the four tzitzis is necessary for the mitzvah fulfillment because all four elements of a single mitzvah, meaning the four corners, as opposed to having one corner and I did one mitzvah, you have to have all four corners to fulfill the mitzvah. Okay. So there we have the trelas in terms of like the biblical mandate. It's just, it's just, I don't know if there's any other mitzvah like this, where the Torah has like options for how you can fulfill it. Well, like different parts of a mitzvah, you should really do all of them, but if you do one of them, you still fulfill the whole mitzvah. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if there's any other examples of this. If you can think of any, tell me. I don't know. It's filled with two different mitzvahs, right? So, Certainly according to Rabbah, yeah, but two different mitzvahs. You, if you don't have one of the four species, you didn't do the mitzvah yeah, at all. Right. Okay. Right? If, you, you, if you're lacking one of the four, you have no mitzvahs. It's like having strings on three gar on three of your corners on the fourth, right. in which case you have no mitzvah. Wow. Right? But here, it's like you can do half the mitzvah and still do the whole. I don't know if there's any of the mitzvah like this, right? Okay. That's why it's boggling. Yes, that's why it's very, it's very unique. We'll call it unique, right? Maybe, yeah. So, sorry. So maybe when they go into such detail, but they don't mention that each, each string of scissors has that four. Well, not, not not biblically. Rambam goes on to say later that it has that that it should have that, but not biblically speaking. The biblical mitzvah is one, as he just as Rambam just said, although. We all have four divided into two, making it eight. And Rambam does describe that, but that's not the biblical mandate. So yeah, the biblical one, mandate is one straight white one string, white, one, one blue wrapped around that white string. That's it. That's the biblical mandate. But then the sages and the customs have evolved over time to make a much more beautiful mitzvah. 
right, with more detail. Okay, so we're not going to go down the, we're not going to get to the discussion about what happens when your cystis rip and when it's passable or not passable. If it ever happens, come show me, I'll tell you if yay or nay. Because it's not so simple either. Even though, biblically speaking, you only need one strand. Still not so simple. Is this also going to go into if you have, have weird cystis? Or you just have to see it? We're not going to do that today either, no. And how many do you have? I have to strip those four corners. Every, yes, so every gar okay, yes. So, okay, th 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 that's very easy. Sure. Any garment that has four corners must have cystis. Must have cystis. Four, in fact, in fact, in theory, have... if you never wear a garment that has four corners, you never have to wear cystis, biblically speaking. The way the Alter Rebbe phrases it is because you're saying Shema in the morning. And in Shema, you're describing cystis. It looks hypocritical if you're not wearing cystis when you're saying Shema. And because you're putting on tzitzis anyway, and we are enjoined to do mitzvahs as early as possible, you should put on tzitzis right away in the morning. And call Baal Nefesh, anyone who's of you know, God-fearing, should make it a point to uh, wear tzitzis all day long. But it's not that biblically mandated to do so. Biblically speaking, as long, only if you have four garments do you have to, which means if you have eight pairs of clothing, all of which have four gar corners, you must wear tzitzis on every four of them. Right. And you have to take off the garment. You cannot wear a garment that has four corners of that system, which is why mm -hmm. if you look at the, the you look at the Chabad Kapatas, the Chabad uh, Shabbos jackets, which have two corners in the front and the back, one of them will, will be rounded. So if it's like this trouble. Okay, so that shirt, it's not a, considered a corner because the split is not high enough. Right, exactly. All high is a split up, so it has to be at least up half. If not, if not mistaken, right. it's at least up half. That doesn't have to, no. No, it's not to be high enough. No, that's not. It's not a split high enough to be counted as a corner. Oh, okay. If the split went all the way up to like halfway up your garment, oh, then it would be yeah. yeah. Like the capotas like all the way halfway up, right? So which is why one corner is rounded. Yes. Okay. Oh, so now. Split is all the way up. Sorry. Yeah, the split in the capotas is all the way up your, your waist. Yeah. And make it round. Yes, that's right. Okay. So this is as far as the the, the placing of the mitzvah. Where am I? Oops, I see some dropped in. This is as far as the placing of the mitzvah of trellis. Is that it's a half of a mitzvah through which you can fulfill the whole. And likewise, the white is a half of a mitzvah through which you can fulfill the whole. Even though optimally, of course, you're doing both. But isn't Karot to say it's half a mitzvah? mitzvah. It's, it's a mitzvah. It's, one... it's, it's the full mitzvah, but you're only doing half of what Tara said. Uh, which is, it's, it's the same. It's kind of. Really yeah, it's, it's right. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very unique. Yeah. I'm not even sure how to describe it. Unique uh, module, <laughs> if you want to call it that. It's like getting. I mean, it's compared to half of It's like eating. Getting all the calories from a full slice of pizza from you're only eating half. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Okay, so now let's get to, to the to the blue. So what 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 let's start with well we're gonna go a little bit out of order, but we'll come back. So the first thing we're gonna do is we know, okay, I forgot to bring the source for this, but we know that the the trellis, which is blue, that's what trellis is, is blue. But when it comes to tissus, or perhaps every time the Torah says trellis, but we'll leave that for now. But at least when the Torah says trellis by tzitzis, it means a blue that is the, the color of which is extracted from something called the chilazon, the blood of the chilazon. Now, what is the chilazon? So says the Gemara Menachis, Mandala the Mandala 44a, look at the English. The sages taught this chilazon, which is a source of the school, uh, sky blue dye used in ritual fringes, has the following characteristics. The body resembles a sea. Its form resembles that of a fish. It emerges once in 70 years. And with this blood, one dies, wool, sky, blue for ritual fringes. Obviously, therefore, it is scarce and therefore it is expensive. Comes up every 70 years and it's a very unique type of thing. So this is a very vague description. Its body resembles a sea. Its form resembles that of a fish. It emerges once in 70 years. And with this blood, one dies kind. Where does it emerge from and to where? Maybe yes, maybe no. It says that its body resembles a sea. Its form resembles that of a fish. And it emerges once in 70 years. We're going to see Rashi says it emerges from the earth. Rambam says it emerges from the ground, from the, from the ocean, which makes it more complicated. What, what, what is this chalazan? But we'll get there. So before we get to that, sorry. Yeah, well, well, let's see, maybe, yeah. Let's see. Sorry? It's not a kosher fish, yeah. Okay, so let's let's see. So now before we get to let's before we get to um, uh, more about this, more about this description, let's look at when it stopped. When it stopped. It's hard to know when exactly it stopped, but we're gonna give a couple of dates in which it's mentioned, and then the earliest date in which it was 
mentioned specifically as not being around anymore. Okay. So certain times based on would have had it, but even way after that. So let's see. The Gemara relates that Mar, a sage from uh, Mashkain, yeah, brought sky wool, sky, I keep on mispronouncing this, sky blue wool in the years when Rav Ashi was a preeminent sage. Okay. They tested it in the manner described by Rav Yitzchak, son of Rav Yehuda, and its color faded. They then tested it in the manner described by Rav Ada, and the color changed for the better. So just to explain what this, what he's talking about. When you, when you extract that, that blood, you don't just use that right away to die. You have to treat it first. Uh, and you have to treat it in such a way that when you die, the wool, it will never fade. It's one of the characteristics that's needed necessary. So there are two different ways of how you treat it. So they got, they got a hold of the Chilazim, right? This is what the, what the Gemara is telling us, that um, Mar, in the years of Rav, not Rav Ashi, sorry, it's Rav Acha, not Rav Ashi. In the years of Rav Ache, there was a certain sage who, who got a hold of the Chilazim, and they tried the different methods of treating it. One worked, and one didn't work, right? Okay, so now, now we know that in the years of Rav Achai, they did have access to the Chilazim. We know that at least. Okay, so when did Rav Achai live? When did he live? Okay, not Tanoim, it's because it's not a Mishnah, it's a Gemara. And you see it's Aramaic, it's not, it's not Hebrew. Right. So it's certainly the Jewish people in Babylonia, not in Israel, and it's after the destruction of the temple, way after. It's in, it's in Talmudic, it's in post Mishnahic era. But, but when? When exactly does Achai live? Right? All we have is uh, there's, there's, there's three people here. There's Rav Achai. Yeah, there's, no, it's just Mar. And there's this um, Amar, which means master or sir, in the time of Rav Achai. So when did he live and what did he do? Okay, so let's see. Well, you know, he's, so then he's a, a Amarai? Okay, let's see. Yes, let's see. So the next text comes from Tysus. In Zvachim, page 102a, and the Toysvis says like this. I, I didn't look up the Gemara itself, but just look at the Toysvis. The, the picture on top of page, what is it? Five. Page five? The picture there? Yeah, the text there. When is the first time was in the base of Asia, that's what they used to make their. Well, okay, so the, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discussion if the Tchelis of the Mishkan is the same Tchelis as the. It is the same. It's, there's a question if it's the same Tchelis as the Tzitzis. Oh. But the same Tchelis as the Tzitzis definitely comes from the Chilazan. But the question is, did the trailers of the Mishkan just mean blue or also come from the Chilazim? There's a discussion about that, but we're putting it aside for now. Okay, so Rav Achai says Taisus. The Chol Mokayim. No, uh, no, you should be on top page five before. No, no, before the English, before the English. You'll see why I'm putting Rav Ashi in a second, in the Hebrew there. Rav Achai, so it says Taisus, Taisus comments. So t- remember, Taisus lives way after the time of the Gemara is over. Taisus li- is post Rashi, so it's in the late 1100s, wow. is Taisus. So you're talking about a couple of centuries after the Gemara is done. Even after, yeah, Rambam's time. Maybe even a little later. Taisvis. So it's a couple, hundred, couple of centuries after the Gemara is over. So now he's commenting on Rav Achai, who was, a, who was a sage that isn't so known in terms of where he lived and what he did. So Taisvis comments on who he is. And says like this, B'chom Makai, all over, wherever we look at it, L'shoinoi, Rav Achai's language, Mishunah, is different. He speaks with a different language than the rest of the Talmudic scholars, indicating it is from a different era. And the Ashkan Bereis Ksubis, and he gives a citation, as we see in the beginning of Tractate Ksubis, Pashat Rav Achai, where Rav Achai speaks. Okay. And because of that, because Rav Achai's language is somewhat different than the rest of the Gemara, Rav Shmuel would say, this is Rav Achai, the same Rav Achai, which compiled a book called the Sheiltois. This book, the Sheiltois, came from a generation called the Rabbanon Savaroi. These Rabbanon Savaroi, the boss of Ravina and Ravashi. They were after Ravina and Ravashi. Ravina and Ravashi are the ones who redacted the, the Gemara. They were the final sayers on the, on the, on the Gemara. Now, the, the, post-Talmudic, the post-Talmudic era, they were called Rabbanon Savaroi. It's a short era in which scholars lived before they started to formulate the new era of scholarship, which is called the Ga'inim which began the halachic response uh, and, and a new way of learning Torah. So this intermediate generation was called Rabbanu Savaroi. Okay? The Hoi Sefaira, they added instruction to the Gemara. The Kosfu Akhir the Kain Dvarov is Saif Ashas. And they inserted their own conclusions within the end of the discussions in the Gemara. So sometimes the Gemara itself, it's a little bit, it, I don't want to say the word deceptive, but it's, it's unknown to the, to the simple reader, even myself included. You read a text of the Gemara and it's all the same to you. 
But someone like Taisvis who has the language, who understands the language, says, oh, this is different. This has got to be from the generation post Gemara. Who are, okay. an example of the Goyanim? Goyanim? Saja Goyan, of Amram Goyan, of Hai Goyan, of Shrida Goyan. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that has that. Yeah, that, that, title. that title, yes. Yeah. But Rabbanon Savaroi were a little before that. They're in between. So here we have, Taisus is, is, is postulating that Rav Achai is after the era of the Gemara, after Rav Ashi redacts the Gemara. And his words were added to the Gemara. But, continue, concludes Taisus, Mio, however, Bahid Ksubis, in that discussion in Ksubis, the other citation he mentioned earlier, Ishkech Rav Ashi, the mighty Basrei, we see Rav Ashi coming after Rav Achai. So I'm not sure, says Taisus, is he post Rav Ashi? In the Rabbanon Savaroi era, or is he even before Ashi, or Rav Ashi, or maybe the same time as Rav Ashi. Either way, he's around that era, which means Rav Achai lives in the era when the Mishnah, when the Gemara is redacted, which is the time when Rav Ashi lives. That's why I put the next text when Rav Ashi lives. This is a little little passage from Safaria, that website, and this is their profile of Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi Amaraim sixth generation, which is the end of the Amaraic era, right? The Tanayim are the Mishnah, the Amaraim are the Gemara. Right? And the, the Amarayim lasts for, as you see here, six generations. When the Gemara is finally redacted under Ravina and Ravashi. Ravachai living somewhere in that era. So Ravina and Rav, Ravashi lives circa 375, 425 of the common era. Less than 1500 years ago. It's, it's about when the Gemara is redacted. Yeah. It's a couple centuries before, before, um, before Rambam, which is in the 10 hundreds, right? So it's 500 years before. Okay, so Gemara says, I'm sorry, uh, Safari describes Ravashi. Ravashi studied under the students of, the students of Abaye and Rava, right? Abaye and Rava being the fourth generation. Then there was Abaye and Rava students, and then Ravashi learned under them and became head of one of the academies at age 14. 14 years old, became one of the head of the academy, imagine that. He continued in that position for 60 years and was a dominant Jewish religious leader in, of his time, taking ad advantage of the tolerance of Shapur the second successors, that is the king of Babylonia. He collected uh, the king of Babylonia. He collected all the preserved explanations of the Mishnah, meaning the Gemara, and his parallel works. This laid the groundwork for the Babylonian Talmud. Oh. Okay, so now we can place Rav Achai and his finding of the Techelas sometime in the year 450, 500, somewhere there. Where I the don't know. No, I'm saying Rambam is 1100. Oh. Pesos is in 1100 commenting about something from 500 years ago. Pesos is saying, I can tell Rav Achai's language is different, so I'm not sure where to place him, but he's definitely somewhere at the end of the Gemara's era. So if the Gemara just told us that Rav Achai got a hold of Chilazayim, in other words, we can imagine like this. Rav Achai is learning the Gemara because he's, he's, he's already after Rav Ashi or sometime around then when the Gemara is maybe available. And in the Gemara, he sees two different ways of treating the Chilazayim. So he decides, let's get a hold of the Chilazayim and see if we can do it. So he goes, gets a hold of it, which means there was some sort of trouble. It wasn't readily, readily available. He had to go out there and get it, treated it in the two different versions and saw this one worked and this one didn't. But at least we know that it was still known to the sages what the Chilazim was in this era. Even if it wasn't commonplace, as we see, Rav Acha had to go get a hold of it, but at least they knew what it was. And they could get it if they wanted to, and they did. Yeah, but it had to come up in seven years, so it's not a thing it had to totally in front of Okay, we'll get there. We'll get to that also. We're going to, talk, we're going to touch on that a little bit also. Anyway, so in 345, whatever it was before they had it, yeah. mm -hmm. well, 1,500 years ago they had it. That, for sure. Okay, so now... Let's go back a few two generations, right? We said just now that Rav Achai learned at the same time as Rav Ashi, and Rav Ashi is two generations after Abaye and Rava. Abaye and Rava are preeminent scholars of the Gemara. They're the fourth generation of Amarayim, and their students taught Rav Ashi. So we're backing up two generations, and we're going to see that even two generations before Rav Ashi, still in Babylonia, they knew what the Chilozen was, but had a hard time getting it, mm. right? Uh, we're this is kind of seven every seven years. The, right, making it very difficult to get. Right. But not just difficult to get because of once in seven years, also because of its location. It seems like, as we're going to see, it wasn't available in Babylonia. It was only available in Israel. Mm -hmm. So traveling from there to there with the, with the split in the political split between Babylonia and, and Israel and traveling between the two places was very difficult. And as we're going to see, even in the times of the Gemara, when they knew what the Chilazim were, they had a hard time getting it. And that's why I'm suggesting that Rav Achai himself had a hard time getting it, which is why the Gemara records such a big piece of news. Rav Achai got it and he tried the different treatments. Right? But yeah. backing up two generations, we're going to see Rav also had a hard time getting it. And actually yeah. wasn't even successful, as we'll see. Do we have any idea what size? Oh, we'll get to that also. We're, yeah. we're going to get to all this. Yeah. Let's just go step by step. Okay, so this is the Gemara in Sanhedrin. 
Daf Yud Beis Amidalav of Aleph Seven Hundred Twelve A says the Gemara. The sages of Eretz Yisro sent the following encoded message to Rava during the time of Roman persecution. So the, the Jews are in Israel under Roman occupation. There's some. There's a small impoverished uh, community of Jewish people still in Eretz Yisro, but the dominant force of Jewish life and scholarship is in Babylonia, where Rava is, modern day Iraq, Iran, on the on, on the Tigris and Euphrates, right? So during that time, they, the Rava gets, a, gets an encoded message from his colleagues in Israel. Okay? This is the encoded message. A pair of Torah scholars came from Rakath, the biblical name for Tiberias, for Tiberias Tveria, which was the seat of Sanhedrin in Rava's time. So even though the, the dominant scholarship and life is in Babylonia, the Sanhedrin is still in Jerusalem. That's the that, that's halacha, that the, that the Sanhedrin has got to be in Yisrael. In fact, the Gemara describes at certain times. Sorry, that's right. Sorry, sorry. The Romans didn't let them live in Jerusalem at the time. That's right. They were kicked out. They were sent to the north. So they were in Yavne and Tiberia, even higher up north, right? So, but but the Sanhedrin was always in Eretz In fact, there was a the word records a certain uh, struggle of power between Babylonia and and Israel. Israel claiming we're Eretz Yisrael and Teres supposed to come from Eretz Yisrael, whereas the Jews in Babylonia claiming we have the dominant force of Jewish life and Jewish scholarship and so on. But that's not, so. This is kind of in that era. In that, in that historical context. So he gets. Sorry? It's a, it's a birth to Yeshua. Describe it. Yeah, describing Rakas as, 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 as yeah. Tiferia. Okay. So they get a message from Rakas, from the Sanhedrin, basically. They meant to reach the diaspora community. Okay. So, so what's, what's, the, uh, what's the message? That a pair of Torah scholars came from Rakas, came from the Sanhedrin. They meant to reach the diaspora community, meaning we sent two scholars on a mission to you guys in the diaspora. But the pair was apprehended by the eagle. Encoded message for IE Roman soldiers. It's a code for, for Rome because they know their message is being intercepted. So they write it in code. We sent you two scholars, but they were caught by the eagle, meaning by the Roman soldiers, whose symbol was the eagle. And their procession, their possession, what they were carrying with them, were precious items made in Luz. So this is the code Rava receives. Two people were caught by the Romans and they brought something for you from Luz. Or something that's made in Luz. What's that? Awesome. It explains the Gemara. The Gemara interrupts the story to explain. And what are these items from Luz? The sky blue dye, which is necessary for ritual fringes. The message continues. In, their mer in the merit of the divine mercy, and in their merit of these two scholars, they were spirit execution and immersion peace. Nevertheless, they did not reach their destination. So even before Rabachai, two generations before, in Rava's time, he tried to get a hold of the Chilazayim, because the guys in Eretz know what it is, and they have access to it, and someone tries to send it to him, but didn't make it. Okay. So we can see that even when they knew it, there's, a, there's like an error when they know it, but they're having a hard time getting a hold of it. Rav is successful, but Rav wasn't. How is Lowe's working? Why Lowe's? Maybe that's the region where they were able to get it. Sorry, yeah, maybe that's the region where they were able to get it. I'm not sure, I don't remember. Okay, so now you can see, I just put quickly who Rav is, the fourth generation, uh, Marayim, fourth generation, two generations before Rav Rav is the most known of his for his discussion with Abaye. He learned under many teachers and eventually became the head of the academy of Mechuza, to which he drew many students. He was wealthy and, when needed, was able to intercede for the Jewish people with the mother of the king of Shapur and the second of Persia. Right, King Shapur's successor is the one that Rav, is Rav, that Rav Ashi deals with, whereas Rav is dealing with the mother of King Shapur. Okay, so this is hundred years earlier, or sixty something years earlier, three twenty to three fifty. So we see that already in the times at the end of the Gemara, they know what the Chilazan is, but are having a hard time with it. Okay. Now we'll get to the earliest text that tells us that the Chilazan is not available. Okay? Says the, says the Tanchuma. The Tanchuma is a halachic midrash. Wait, hold on. We just said that despite their whole code, they still get intercepted. They, they, they well, the know. message came after, right? Oh. Rava got the message, but never got the actual... Never, he got a message saying that we tried sending you two guys. They got apprehended, oh. and they had Chilazan for you. But we're sorry, we couldn't get it to you. Okay. So he got the message which he records in the Gemara, but he never got the Chilazim. Right. The message was saying, we're sorry we tried to send you Chilazim, we couldn't do it. Right. And we're lucky that they're alive. Right. Right. Real thing is real body or real yes, they sent, the, they sent the blood. They sent, they sent the fish or they sent the blood. They sent the Chilazim, whatever it is. Sorry? And you have to work down to die. Right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, you yeah. said the other ones weren't able to. They weren't much there to make the Chilazim. So they Rav, okay, Rav Achim got Chilazim, and they tried two different methods and of correct. One worked, one didn't. The Gemara says one worked, and one didn't. Two, two methods of treating it. Maybe it's just okay, so I get right. So the, the other thing you see is that the Romans are 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 
are, um, what's the word? They're keen on stopping communication, especially religious communication between Jerusalem and, and Bavel, which would, which would explain why at one point it got lost. And this is, uh, there's lots of uh, lots written about this and you can Google uh, Rav Cook, chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Av Mitzvah Cook, he wrote a doctorate on the history of the Chilazim and the history of Tchelet. And he has a suggestion as to what the actual Tchelet is. It's not the suggestion we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at a different suggestion today uh, because we wanna to get to the Chabad opinion. The Chabad opinion responds to the other suggestion, not to Rav Cook's suggestion. Um, but in his research, he contends and he puts a date at when there was a decree that would have stopped the Chilazim from being transferred from Israel to Babylonia and thus ending it. That, that he puts a date to that. Romans did that so we can see here the old Romans caught these two guys and, and luckily they're not, they're not dead, right? The Roman, right? So that means that there, there's- Not because of and generals, because they were bringing- Okay, so there's, there's yeah. in general, and then there's also certain decrees that they did to control the market of dyes or, or to use certain dyes for like, uh, only for their royalty or for whatever. It was also against dyes specifically. You can check out Rabbi Cook's uh, uh, thesis, the word doctor. Yeah, all the information they had there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure that is. We'll, we'll, let's see. Let's see. Well, it's close. We'll get to that. We'll see. Let's see. Let, 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 we'll, go, we'll see. Let's see. Okay. So now let's. So we have we have the last text. We just read the last text that, that described the known existence of Chilazan. One in which they successfully achieved to get it in Babylonia under Abachai, and one in which they unsuccessfully they didn't get it, but they knew it was there. Uh, that's in times of Rava. So we already see there's a struggle trying to keep it going. Now, here's the earliest text that says we don't have it anymore. And this is the Medrash Tanchuma. The Midrash Tanchuma is a halachic Medrash called Tanchuma because it's, uh, it it's primarily quotes a rabbi named Tanchuma, as we'll see in a second in the description. You skipped over Rava? We just read it. Isn't it? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so actually, no, let's read the description of Tanchuma. Tanchuma composed Hamodic Babylonia, Italy, Israel, circa 500, circa 800. So it goes way after the Gemara. Right, the Gemara ends in Ravashi's time, which we said was cir circa, what was Ravashi? Circa 425 or something, right? 450. 425 is, is, is around when Ravashi is. And this, the Tanchuma, goes later. It starts 500 and goes to 800. So it's a, it's a later text. Not much later, but later, right? So uh, tells us Safaria and his description of Tanchuma. Midrash Tanchum is a midrash on the five books of the Torah, structured as sermons on the opening verses of each paragraph in the Torah. Named the Talmudic sage of Tanchum, who features prominently in the text, it is also referred to as Tanchum Yelandenu, because of the prevalence of legal patches, passages that start with the words Yelandenu Rabbeinu, teach us our rabbi, right? As if like, you know, give us a sermon, teach us something, and then it goes on to speak. The dating and composition history of the Tanchum are matters of scholarly debate, but we have roughly when an, an era of when it comes from. Now, here's the earliest text in which there's a clear statement. I'm sorry, we don't have Chilazan anymore. Says Tanchuma, the Hebrew up there, Hebrew above the text we just read. Ela mitzvah lavon The mitzvah is to have both the white and the blue and put them together. A Mosai, when is this mitzvah doable? Because a when we actually have the Tchelas, when we have the blue, when we have that Chilazan. The Achshav, however, nowadays, ain't lanu ela lavon. We are left with nothing but the love on the white. Shatrelas nignas. The trelas has been concealed. Mitzvah belavon, and for the mitzvah is with the white one alone. So here we have, somewhere between the year 500 and 800, a clear statement we have no chilazan anymore. So we, the last statement we had was for something when they did have chilazan. Aracha gets it. And a couple hundred centuries, two centuries later, we don't have it anymore. So it's somewhere in this era when the That's decrees. Somewhere in this or time, 500. something like that, or five, somewhere between 500 and 800, so maybe it's 700, maybe it's whatever. Um, I saw one date 750, whatever. Uh, either way, it's sometime in this century or two when the decrees are to the point that there's no more chilazan. Okay, so we're left now with, if you want to know what the chilazan is, we're left with the original description that the Gemara gave us, which was, what was the uh, description? Let's look at the description back again. Yeah, uh, its body resembles a sea. It form, its form resembles that of a fish and emerges once in 70 years. That's what we have to describe. So how, what do we do with this kind of statement? How, how do we find Chilazan with that? It's, it's very difficult, right? So we have to look at, sorry? 
because he has to shut the share of work. There's no way that Colossus is going to fight the share of work. That's the Leviosan. Oh, Leviosan. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let, now, so what we're doing now is we're fast forwarding to the Rishonim. Rishonim are the generation later, the, the generation of Rashi in the 1100s, and Rambam in the 1000s, and even later, Radvaz, and what they try to, uh, how they understand that passage in the Gemara, and what this Chilazan is. So first we're going to look at Rashi, Rashi's commentary to that Gemara. So uh, we're, look, we're on page, um, we're on page six in the middle there, which is Rashi, Lemanaches Mendalachon. With me, uh, Mayor. I'm confused with why it says yeah. the history of Tantuma matters in scholarly debate. I mean, it's, it's questioning the validity. The validity no, just, just, just of when it came about and who wrote it and who compiled it. Not like questioning the validity, God forbid. Okay. Just when exactly was it written, who put it together, when was it first published? Okay, but not the that. content. No, not the content, God forbid. Okay. Just the dating and composition, that's all. Right, dating composition. Some people say. No, 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 God forbid. Is like... <clears throat> okay. Maybe no, no, it's just telling us why they give us a year for 500 to 800. That's a 300 year discrepancy. Right. <laughs> okay. Because they, they don't know. Right. That's all. Okay, so. Did he live for 300 years? Or obviously not. not. So it's somewhere between those years when this is put together. So right. somewhere between those years, there's someone stating clearly we don't have Chilozan anymore. Right. That's the point. Okay. So somewhere in that era that it ends. Okay. So now we have Rashi to that Gemara, right? The Gemara said that it's got to look, it looks like a the sea. And it comes up every 70 years. So it says Rashi, Gufay, its body, Mara Gufay, Tavnis the Yuknai, the look of its body and the structure of its build. That's what it means when it says that it looks like the sea. And then when it says, Vo'ila, it emerges once every 70 years, Rashi says, Minaharats, it emerges from the earth. Uh, the one above that, the Rashi just above that. That's it. Vo'ila goes up, Minaharats from the earth. So in Rashi's view, the Chilazain, is not a fish. It comes from the earth. The reason why we're talking, we confuse it with a fish is because the Gemara says its body looks like the sea and its, and its blood looks like the sea or whatever, but, but it resembles a fish or it resembles a sea, whatever that means. Maybe because it's slimy, maybe because it's moist, maybe because of the color, I don't know. But it emerges from the earth once every seven years in Rashi's view. It doesn't resemble the sea. That's right. So that's Rashi's view. Now, to, to, to um, support this view that comes from the earth, um, supporters of Rashi cite the following Gemara, which we're reading now, Megillah Vav Aleph, Megillah 6a. I'm moving very fast, love for sources. Are you with me? Yeah. The bottom of page six there. Well, we get the right, so the, the therefore, because it doesn't come up only once every 70 years, therefore it's very expensive because it emerges from the earth once every 70 years. Okay. So now the, um, the, the supporters of Rashi cite the following Gemara to indicate that it actually comes from the earth. Yeah, following? Yeah. So what's the Gemara say? The Gemara says in the Megillah 6a, the verses should be interpreted as follows. The context is not important. Zavulun said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, to my brothers, the tribes whose territories adjacent to mine, you gave fields and vineyards, whereas to me, you gave me mountains and hills. To my brothers, you gave lands, whereas to me, you gave me seas and rivers. So God said back to him, nevertheless, all will need you. All your brothers will need you due to the Chilazim. A small sea creature residing in your territory that is a source of the dye in the ritual fringes of Sitsis. Okay, here, the, here it says sea creatures, but, the, but this, this word sea creatures is not the Gemara speaking. That's why Steinsdals is extrapolated commentary yeah. speaking. It just says the Chilozen is in your territory. As it is stated, in, so we know, so now we have a region where the Chilozen comes from, from Zavolan's region, right? Now we have, a, we have a region. We're honing in. We're honing in. It comes from, it comes from Zavolan. So now this explains the Gemara's earlier where they're sending people from Mary Chisirol to bring you from Babylonia, because it's not available in Babylonia. It's available in, in Zavulun land, yeah? So as it's stated in Moses' blessing to Zavulun, they shall call the people of the mountain, to the people of the mountain, meaning to you, Zavulun, who live in a mountainous region. So the people will call to you. There, shall be, uh, there they shall sacrifice offerings of the righteous, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of the hidden treasures of the sand. So people cite to this, to indicate the Chilazim comes from the earth. Yeah. Proof to Rashi's view. It comes from Zavulun. And what's the Gemara's proof that it comes from Zavulun? Because there's hidden treasures in the land of Zavulun. And that's the verse that the Gemara uses to prove that the Chilazim is by Zavulun. Yeah. But it also says that you suck the abundance of the seas. That part of the Gemara is not quoted, but that part of the verse is not quoted in the, in the Gemara. 
That's interpolated. Right. That's, in, that's the rest of the verse. But in the Gemara it says, right. Right. So this is a, that's right. So this is a proof that many yeah. cite to the Rashi's view that the Chilozen comes from the land. Page 6a. Not the Gemara Megillah, not the, not the Megillah. Not the Megillah as in the Esther. But the, okay. So this is Rashi's view. Now it's the Rambam's view. Rambam, chapter 2. Halacha 1 and 2, page 7 in the English. The term Tchelet mentioned throughout the Torah refers to wool dyed light blue. Okay, so remember, throughout the Torah, we meet Rambam means here, not the Tchelet of Tzitzis. I mentioned before there's a discussion whether the Tchelet of Tzitzis is the same as the Tchelet of Mishkan, or whether they're different Tchelet. Rambam is of the view that they're different Tchelet. So as explained, the term Tchelet mentioned throughout the Torah, anywhere in Torah with respect to the Mishkan or anything, refers to wool dyed light blue, i.e. the color of the sky, which appears opposite the sun when there is a clear sky. So it's a very light blue. The term trailet when used regarding tzitzis, not regarding the rest of everything else, but regarding tzitzis, refers to a specific dye that remains beautiful without changing. If the tzitzis does not dye with this specific dye, it is unfit to be used at tzitzis even though it is sky blue in color. For example, using istalis, black dye, or dar other dark dyes is unacceptable for tzitzis. The wool of an eu that a goat gave birth to is unacceptable for use as tzitzis. Okay, so says says Rambam, trailers throughout Torah could be just blue, sky blue for the Mishkan. But trailers for tzitzis must be made of this kind of ingredient that that, that stays beautiful even after even after a long time. But it's not specifying blue; it's just specifying that it's beautiful. Forever. No, but the, the blue the blue is that's is um, no, it's it's a blue that stays beautiful always. Okay. okay. So now continues Rambam in Halacha number two, chapter two. Sorry. Sorry. Can you also explain? I'm unfamiliar with the the uh, Mishkan part. The certain yeah. fabrics in the Mishkan had tchelas in it. Oh. The Torah says that it should be tchelas. So that it's just really means dyed blue. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the chelazan. There are those that say it also has to be the chelazan there too. Like the, but Rambam seems to be saying no. Saying for like the begad of the kahanim or the offering or the, for, the Mishkan had tapestries. Oh, oh the tapestries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I think also the even the kahanim's garments had tchelas in it. Right, it's also trailers as with trailers. So, is that also from the chelazon? I'm saying no. Throughout Torah, trailers just means light blue. When it comes to when it comes to tzitzis, trailers means specifically made of this specific ingredient, as I'll explain. So, how is the the trailer of tzitzis dyed? Wool is taken and soaked in lime. The lime helps uh, helps uh, somehow removes all the dirt and helps the wool open to absorb more of dye. Afterward, it is taken and washed until it's clean. And then boiled with bleach and the like, as the dyers practice the dyers is practice to prepare it to accept the dye. Right, this, this is the way of preparing the material to absorb the dye. Okay, a chilozain is a fish whose color is like the color of the sea, like the Gemara said, it looks like the sea, and whose blood is black like ink, and it is found in Mediterranean Sea. Okay, now I want to look. You look at the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, go three lines up. In the middle it says, Ubiyam Hamelech How would you translate Mamelech? Oh, Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. Why are they translating Mediterranean Sea? We'll see why in a moment. But for now, it's translated as the Dead Sea. So Rambam says it comes from the Dead Sea, at least if we're taking the literal translation of Rambam. Right. The blood is placed in a pot together with herbs, e.g. Uh, chamomile, as a dyer's practice. That's the, that's the solution or the, the treatment. It is boiled and then the wool is inserted. It is left there until it becomes sky blue. This is the manner in which Tchelet of Tzitzis is made. And if you don't have this, uh, it's not kosher. So, but what what did Rambam say before you get into the fact that it's Mediterranean Sea or the, or the Dead Sea? It's from the sea. It's from the sea. Like so, already have a dispute between Rashi and Rambam, which means it, it already explains why it's extremely difficult for any post Talmudic era to start to do an investigation and discover what the Chilazan is. Because you've constantly you have, you have all these different uh, opinions. You have, you have a vague description from the Gemara. You have locations from Zavulun, but in Zavulun, which has oceans, right, it's near the Kinneret. Right. Oh, sorry, near the Mediterranean, and it's got rivers and whatnot. Is it from the land, as Rashi suggests, or is it from the ocean, like Rambam suggests? And then there are all kinds of other views and other descriptions of what this chilozin is, based on what they heard, based on different gemaras, based on different verses, making it very difficult for anyone to say, I know this absolutely is chilozin. So I'm, I'm putting doubt in, before we even get to those who suggest what the chilozin is, I've already explained to you where the skepticism comes from. Because you see all this kind of, and all I've showed you is two opinions. If we start to collect all of them, it's never ending to see, you know, where exactly the chilozin is and what exactly it is, right? 
right, right here. Is it from a land creature or is it an ocean creature? We don't know. The Yamamala plays woman? No, it's not. Oh, really? Oh, so because, okay, so good, good point. That's right. So because, that's right. So because the Yamamala is not by Zvolen, there are some that are, let's say, question on Rambam. How could Rambam say that it's Yamamala, which is Dead Sea, if the Dead Sea is not by Zvolen? So they answer, the Yamamala actually means the Mediterranean. And I saw in one footnote somewhere where they cite to elsewhere in Rambam, where Rambam is definitely talking about the Mediterranean Sea and he uses the term Yamamala. Why? For what reason? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Really for, for I don't know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that, that's why that's why this translation yeah. says Mediterranean Sea, especially considering that the as far as actually they, they did they did discover a tiny little fish now. Recently they discovered a tiny fish in the a tiny tiny fish they discovered in the Dead Sea. But other than a tiny little fish, there's nothing living in the Dead Sea. Mm-hmm. Hence, it's, hence it's called the Dead Sea. They recently discovered a tiny tiny right like I think you need like a microscope to see it. But it definitely wouldn't be the Chilazan. It's too small. But either way, that's why the transit is Mediterranean Sea, because the Gemara says it's Zvulun, and Zvulun doesn't have the Yama Melech. Right? It's the sky blue. At least with Ashis, the Rambam says that it's a light the sky blue. And then it says... Okay, yeah. So, but it's originally black, and then once you mix it with chamomile and herbs, then it becomes right. sky blue. Water. Sorry? Yeah, so it has to be mixed with the other things, yes. That, that, that was Rav Achai saying, that he tried two different solutions, Right. One worked, one didn't work, right? Because right. it has to retain its blue right. for a long time. That's what Rambam wrote, right? Yeah. Rambam took that from the Gemara, which Avachai tested when he got the Chilazan. Black, I think that's like so. It's got to be so. You go from black to sky blue. The huge you have to, gradient. Uh, yeah. Well, I suppose uh, it could be it itself is black, but once you add these other alloys, it waters it down. It waters it down, and then and then even when the when the material soaks it in, it could be when you take it out, even if the ink is black, it comes out right. blue, right? Right. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so what, what time what time is Mincha? I want to be able to finish at least part one before 8.45? Okay, so the next text we have is from the Advaz. You can see here it's 1573 to 1479. Um, I don't want to read his whole text, but he basically writes on page, uh, the way, uh, page, uh, page eight. I'm on page eight. It's only here. I'll just I'll tell you what it says there. If you can look at it later. He says that it's like Rashi, that it comes from Earth. the ocean. No. Oh, no, sorry, like, like Rambam, that it comes from the ocean in Zavulun's territory. And um, it would emerge from the water to the ocean only once. Uh, it, would, it would emerge every 70 years, and that's how they would just take it. But at a later time, uh, it stopped emerging. But once the Jewish people were scattered throughout the exile, and there's only a few people left behind in Eretz Yisrael by under the Nebuzaradin, then the Echilazim stopped popping up. And they would, actually, they would actually have to go down there and hunt it. So Radvaz adds that actually it is a huntable animal. But it used to come up every once every 70 years, making it easily accessible. As like almost offering themselves up for the mitzvah. But that stopped after the exile, and they have to go hunt it. They have to go hunt it. Uh, what's the word? Fish for it. They have to trap it. You know? So they would go out there and trap these fish and fish for it. Okay. So it's available, but just we don't know what it is. And we don't know where how to trap it or whatnot. All right. So now let's go a little forward in history. So the next text, the middle text there, where there's number two, comes from a book called Hatcheles Bechidusha, the Tcheles and its Renewal. Uh, quite a bit of my research is reliant on this book, written by a contemporary rabbi who's still alive, I believe, Shmuel Ariel. He wrote this, it's a 30 page pamphlet, I should say, which I found on my nifty little digital library that I have. That I have. Um, just search the word Tcheles and it comes up. It's pretty cool. So he says like this. Okay, so let me back up. I didn't let me back up. My, my research started from the Rebbe Shab, right? The whole point is I want to get to the Chabad view here. And the Chabad view is articulated by the fifth Chabad Rebbe. Now the fifth Chabad Rebbe writes a letter to, if you go to the next page, uh, no, never mind. If you go to page uh, 11, you'll see a picture of a, of a rabbi on page 11. Let me see this picture. So the his name is um, his name is as you can see in the Rebbe Shab's text, Mordechai Yosef Eliezer Liner. He is the Rebbe of Radzin, Radzin slash Izbitza, which is an offshoot of Kotsk. Now this rabbi, he authored books. He sent to the Rebbe Shab copies of his father's books. His father's books, his his predecessor, the Rebbe of Radzin Izbitza before him 
wrote a number of books on Tehillahs. And he claimed to discover what the Tehillahs is. And then Rabbi Shab responds by saying, I'm sorry, I reject the premise. He writes to the son, to the person in the picture here. Right, the son sent the books of his father, and the Rebbe responds by saying, thank you for your father's books. I've been wanting to see it for a while. I'm sorry I can't agree with your father's conclusion. We'll, we'll look at that letter next week, why the Rebbe Shab doesn't agree with this conclusion. So in trying to dig up a little bit, or trying, whatever, just digging up uh, what kind of research this Radzin Rebbe did to discover what the Tehillus is, this is why I relied on Rabbi Shmuel Ariel and this book here called so back to page uh, eight. That's right. That's right. I'm just giving you the history of who the Rebbe is responding to. All of this, if you get to the history of who the Rebbe is responding to. Okay, so let's see. In the year, I'm just reading it. I'm, I'm translating the English direct. I'm translating directly to English. It's uh, in this book. It's not. It's not a. I mean, it's a modern book. It's not like I have to. You know, Okay. If I was reading Rashi, if I was reading Rashi, I would treat every word as, as holy. This is a modern book now. Okay, so in the year 1887, the, 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 the Rebbe of Radzin got up. His name is of Gershon Chanoich Liner, Henech Liner, he was called. And he claimed that we must seek, seek out the Chilazan in order to bring back the mitzvah of Chilaz. So he went out. The, 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 the method of him going to find this Chilaz is to look throughout our sages for the various different descriptions of the Chilazan, and then to go find animals that match all the descriptions. Right, that's, that's always, that was a suggestion. So this is what he did. So first of all, he, he published a book called Shafunei Timunei Chel. That's the quote that the Gemara said earlier to tell us that Zvulun had treasures hidden in the sand. He labeled his book in those words, because this is the treasures of the sand, this is Chilazan. He put out a book in which he suggests the actual possibility for finding the Chilazan. And he lists there the various different sources that describe what the Chilazan is. That's phase one. He published a book. Here are the list of descriptions of what the Chilazan is. It's a possibility. We can go out and get it. In a later stage, he traveled himself to Napoli in Italy, to a museum, to a museum, and to, a zoo, to, and to zoology. And there, he looked for animals that would match the descriptions he published in his earlier book, right? He came to the conclusion that the animal we're looking for is what's called in Hebrew, the Yonin Har Koichim, which is translated as the common cuttlefish. Oh, so you can look at okay. page 10, and there you have the picture. I think on page 10 is a picture. I'm sorry, I didn't print it in, in yeah, color. Cuttlefish. Common cuttlefish. It's a kind of squid. Sorry? That's the animal he says matches all the descriptions that he found. Yeah, as now, you can see on page 10. Because everybody's just quoting a different fish. That's, that's, I'm sorry, that's what I'm telling you. I, I gave you guys the skepticism before the conclusion. <laughs> Explain to you why we're so controversial at the time. Like, you know, for, thousands, for hundreds of years, Jews say they don't know because you have all kinds of opinions. And you're coming along and saying, you do know? This was the reaction of many in the Torah world. Mm -hmm. But he still claimed that he did the research and went to Italy and searched out and found all the, all the different descriptions of our sages and what the Chilazan is, and he found an animal that matches all the descriptions. That's his view, okay? Just a little, Sorry? Just a little bit of info. Yeah. If you go to Chinatown, yeah. Chinatown Wait, I don't want to know about that. <laughs> okay, On, if you're going back, you go back a second, uh, page nine, you can see the cover page of that of that uh, book called Shiftuni Timune Chol. I put the cover page there, yeah. and you can see it's published in the year Tafish Mem Zion, uh, 1887. And more so, it's page, uh, page nine, you see a picture of the cover title of that book, where he postulates that we should go find the Chilazan, because here's the list of all the descriptions. Okay, so continues uh, this book describing the history of, uh, of Rabbi Henech Lehner, the Rebbe of Rajin. So did he go and find it? Sorry? He did all the research. He actually so he found this thing called the internet, he found this thing called the common cuttlefish, and he claims that's the right one. And he made it famous, so. Yes. So the, the, the writer continues saying, this is not the Chilazin as we know it in our language today, but it's kind of like a small uh, octopus that has, it has like this like a uh, musky ink. I'm, just, I'm, I'm translating what he writes there, that it puts out to the water in order to hide from his enemies like a smoke screen. You know, like this fish that let out like a yeah. black little. Oh, so this kind of, this apparently this kind of fish does the same thing. Yeah. 
from that black thing that it emits, the Reb of Radzin was successful in producing a dot, a blue oh, dye. Wow. Was yes. Herbal mixture? Now he continues that the author writes that he was he was careful to only use methodologies that were available to those in ancient times and Talmudic eras. Because if you were to use modern technology to extract dye from that thing, mm -hmm. then it, it would it would demonstrate the invalidity of what he's saying. Because right. it has to, so he specifically only used methodologies that were available then, and he and he succeeded in producing a blue dye. But he says clearly ain't that No, that, that's that's it's. Could you read reading? which we consider today, but the, the, this is the author of Bishmul Arieli saying, Bishmul Arieli Ariel saying that the fish that he found not what we refer to as chilazon, but it's what he claims that chilazon is. He's saying that for the modern Hebrew speaker, he loves it and not translate it as, um, that's yeah, that's squid. But he loves it in the modern Hebrew means something else. It means a certain kind of, a certain kind of fish. It doesn't mean this specific one. But he says that this is the biblical chilazon, or this is the Talmudic chilazon, because it matches all the descriptions that he get. And he he traveled from somewhere in Eastern Europe all the way to, all the way to Italy to, to to go to museums and discover this to search all animals. Yeah. yeah, he came with a list of descriptions from all the sages and went from animal to animal. Matched the list, matched the list, matched the list. They finally found the animal and said, oh, I found him. He would argue with Rambam because he's saying the biblical one and Rambam doesn't hold it. Rambam says it comes from the earth. Sorry, Rashi. The one is different than the one we No, what's that? Like, no, don't, don't confuse everything. Yeah. The, 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 the Ariel Shmuel, when he says this is not the chilazim we speak of today, he means in modern Hebrew. You modern Hebrew people who use the word chilazim in your modern language have nothing to do with the Talmud chilazim. Oh. That's what he's saying. What what but what the Rebbe of Radzin was looking. The Rebbe of Radzin didn't care for modern Hebrew. He was researching the, the, the Talmudic right. Chilazan. and the Talmudic Chilazan is unrelated to the modern Hebrew ver translation of the word Chilazan. Right. That's what the author is telling right. me. Telling people don't even know what it was. Exactly. He's he's telling the reader. This is a book for the masses of reader. He's telling the reader what you in modern Hebrew refer to as Chilazan, yeah. unrelated to the what he's looking for. So it's related to the beginning. Is that what, what's called? Mollusk. What's a mollusk? Family. Oh, it's that family? Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So this, so the one who would come to that conclusion is, now you know who it is and where he came from, where he was in the year 1887. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, and, but with this began to become, he started to populate this idea of the Tchelis again in the, in the late 1800s. And uh, till this very day, his followers, and he writes that during the Holocaust it was lost, but then someone in Israel rediscovered it. And the Hasidim of Radzin, as likewise many in Breslov, use this Tchelis from Cuttlefish. Not all of them, Not all. because there's another variation of Tchelis done by the research of Rabbi Cook. I mentioned before that Rabbi Cook wrote a doctorate on Tchelis. He comes to a different conclusion. I'm not mistaken, some sort of plant. I, 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 didn't, I didn't get to read it all properly. Come on, but that's completely Why? wrong. How could it be a plant? Why not? Say. Where does the Gemara say it's not a... from the sand or it's from the ocean? So plant comes from sand. Like seaweed. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I, I'm not sure. I, you know, I shouldn't come over cook. I shouldn't come. No, but you saw from that vase, it doesn't have to come every 70 years. It was just like a miracle that it came to every 70 years, right? It, it, you, know, it's like you can kind of move around all these things. That's my point, which is why, which is why as soon as this, as soon as Rabbi, as soon as Rabbi Henech Leiner of Radzin came out with this, with this claim that he found Chilas, it caused a major uproar to our world. What are you talking about? For, for centuries, Jews are saying, we don't know what it is. Yeah. And you found it. And you don't think other scholars were, you know, right. had their heart and souls in Torah and wish they can fulfill the chalice? You know, you're going to find it now? I don't think that they, you know, the Kiddush to go to Italy and, and find some zoo. of zoology. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we're talking about the Rebbe Virginia here, but still, uh, yes, that, that was the reaction. That was the reaction. So some some felt that it was like a preparation for Mashiach's coming. Anyway, so the point my point is that a cook has a different um, uh, ingredient, and there are those that use that ingredient. But, but I think the, amongst the Hasidim, Wait, this would be the more common. Is one this fish? No, the plant. According to the, the I, 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 again, I don't know. I did not. I, I did reading on Rabbi Dragina's research. I did not do enough reading on Rav Cook's reading. Uh, Rav Cook's um, research to to say that I understand it well. And the reason why I'm, and again, so the reason why I'm going with this one and not Rav Cook is because the Rebbe is responding to this researcher, this researcher, this Rebbe who did the research to his son, the Rebbe, respond, the Rebbe responds to the son saying, thank you for sending me your father's books. And here's why I disagree. So uh -huh. I want to get to what exactly, I want to get to what the Rajiner said, and then I can see the Rebbe response. This is, this is the whole, 
exercise here and go on the next people get to represent the rational response. Yeah. Well, the Rebbe of Regine is a contemporary of the Rebbe Rashad. Uh, his son is. Son, son. Son. The Rajin's son, ah, who is his yes. successor, also the Rajin Rebbe, the person whose picture you see on page uh, 11. Right. His, that's the son, that's the son yes. who sent copies of his father's work to the Rebbe Shab. Right. And the Rebbe Shab is responsible. We'll see you next week by saying thank you very much. Right. But here's the reason why I disagree with you. And his father was the one who went to the duology in Italy? Yes. Okay, right. And we're going to see that the Rebbe Shab says, when I was in Berlin, I also saw that fish. <laughs> As we're going to see. Could be. The Rashad, the Rashad says, I went to the aquarium and I saw the fish. But he says, because I didn't think, because I didn't, because you'll see why, why it is that he didn't even care to test it. Because for whatever reasons, you'll see he gives next week of lunch. Could it not have yeah. migrated from Mediterranean? He saw, in, he saw it in, a, in an aquarium, which means they took it from anywhere. It's an aquarium. We didn't see it in the ocean. It's exactly. Rajinder who went to Italy. Didn't go because that was closest to the Volun. Right. He went because it was a popular aquarium and a popular museum that had all these lists that of fish. Around the world. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Not because that was the Volun. Right. Did it, Levy, did anybody test to see if, if a cicada works? What's a cicada? It's a it's an insect that comes up every 17 years, comes out of the ground every 17 years. I, I actually did see. You say the name, I, 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 did, I did see it, yes. I did see it, yeah. It and is. it didn't work? Oh, no, maybe it did work. I, I, I believe there's an opinion that says that that's what it is. That's mm -hmm. Robert Burke. But yes, I did see that, actually. Mm -hmm. I did see I did see that. I think, I think it's part of, I'm not just saying that, I think it's part of Robert Cook's research. But again, I didn't do okay. enough. Okay. Goggling by next, I didn't have enough time. Yes, it does. It comes, it comes out of the ground every 17 years. Okay. And, you know, 70, 17 could be a mistranslation. <laughs> Rashi saying it comes up from the earth, not the ocean. Yeah. So I, I actually, um, okay. So I didn't, as I mentioned, I didn't have enough time to do all the research on Cook as much as I wanted to. because so I was hoping mm. to that I'd there because this is what the Rashi responds to. But uh, by next, next week, God willing, I'll do a little more reading on Rav Cook. And I, if I remember correctly, when I skimmed through it, I saw that name there. Yeah, but he said it's an animal or a plant? An insect. Mm -hmm. so not, but not, uh, Rav Cook gave two versions. Right, he said one he rejected plants. and one he accepted. I have to, again, I, again, I only scanned through, the, scanned through Rav Cook's writing. I'm gonna have to look at it more properly God willing, next week. And he gives two, he gives two options and rejects one, accepts the other. So I'm not, I, I, one of them is this, is this plant, is this anchor talk, this uh, insect you're talking about. Okay, so God willing, next week, I'll have a little more of Cook's research and then we'll look at the Rebbe Rashab and the Rebbe in their response to the Rajinir. Okay. Uh, next week, we'll do it. We'll look at it next week. Okay. All right, Kitten, have a wonderful evening. Very, very fascinating stuff. I found this very fascinating to me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed.